Good morning. It is always good to be at St. John's. I'm very, very grateful for John Ross and his good and faithful intentional leadership here at St. John's. It is good, good to be with you. And what a glorious morning, right? A glorious morning. On Sunday mornings, if I know I'm going to St. John's, I always love to drive down Kingston Pike and Cumberland Avenue and imagine I'm Bishop Sanders driving down the old road to come to the cathedral. And maybe that's not how he got here, but I like to imagine that. And it was a glorious morning as I was coming down here. And folks are going to be confirmed and received and baptized and reaffirmed. And it's just a great day. The story of God is a story of sacred welcome, of return from exile, of divine grace extended to us even before we can say yes. But then Jerry Askew goes and reads that gospel lesson. (laughs) Jerry, thanks for bringing us down. Millstone hanging, hand and foot chopping, eye gouging, humdinger of a teaching. Y'all have to admit, though, you're going to remember the gospel lesson that was read at your confirmation, right? (laughs) You see, some people, they don't remember. You ask them, what was the gospel lesson when you were confirmed? Oh, well, um, it was that one where Jesus heals a lady, I think. No, no, he went down to the river, and then he healed a lady. It was a lake. He was on a mountain. There was some kind of healing. But when they ask you, you're going to remember. You're going to tell them, I'm a millstone hanging, hand and foot chopping, eye gouge, and fully confirmed Episcopalian. (laughs) That's a great way to start a conversation. When you hear this lesson read, it gets your attention. If you're dozing off or your mind's wandering or if you're on your phone back there, it wakes you up and it brings you back. Jesus was and remains in the getting your attention business. To borrow a saying from the Southern novelist Flannery O'Connor, sometimes you have to make your vision apparent by shock. To the hard of hearing, you have to shout, and for the almost blind, you have to draw large and startling figures. This morning, Jesus is drawing large and startling figures. Now, he's not asking us to physically maim ourselves. He is asking us to be all in. Both feet, both hands, both eyes, hold nothing back. Fully immerse yourself in the story of God. And he is also saying, rather, he is shouting, do not hurt my people. Do not hurt my little ones. Do not cause them to stumble. For you see, those two things are connected, aren't they? If I ask you to be all in, to jump with heart and mind and body and soul, then I am asking you to be incredibly vulnerable. I'm asking you to trust me. If I betray your trust, if the church betrays your trust, then it's a kind of wounding that bruises all the way to your soul. So Jesus is shouting when he says to those gathered who could hear him and to us now, do no harm to each other, especially to these who are new in the faith new to the gathered community, new to the ever-expanding circle. Jesus is also saying he's not in the business of competition when it comes to God's Spirit moving in the world. He's not a leader who needs to control and needs to get all the credit. He's in the business of setting the Spirit free to do its work wherever and whenever. I've heard it said that grace is everywhere already doing everything. And for you and me, it does not need the Episcopal brand on it to matter. I like the Episcopal brand. I'm pro-Episcopal brand. 
But God is so much bigger than that. In this morning's gospel lesson, we hear Jesus' call to be all in and trust that the Spirit is moving in ways and places where we are unaware and to live with the spirit of sharing instead of competition. In other words, he's asking us to live in a different world, even as we inhabit this one. Jesus went so far to try to get this message across to us that he joined us. Divine love taking on human flesh to walk among us, to know both both the burden and the joy of human embodiment. To go all in with the incarnation before asking us to go all in and join him in the kingdom of God. Now, I'm aware a lot of you getting confirmed today are in school, right? Sort of late junior high, late middle school, early high school. I got to tell you, I don't know anything about what it's like now to be a school-aged person in Knoxville in 2021. But I have a good memory of what it was like to be in high school in the mid-1980s. This is where Jason starts the soundtrack, okay? (laughs) First, I discovered my primary spiritual gift was awkwardness. You ever had your auras done? Big aura of awkwardness. Light green going to dark green. Always about to throw up in your mouth. I was so awkward, it came with a sound almost. I also became homeless in my own body. I was either too tall or too thin or not macho. couldn't get my hair to feather correctly. (laughs) Can you imagine my hair not feathering correctly? (laughs) And my mother could not buy enough sea breeze astringent to cover (laughs) all the blackheads and all the acne that greeted me each morning. When I smell sea breeze again, I get a little sick to my stomach. It wasn't Jesus who wanted me to gouge out my eye or cut off my hand. It was me. If I could change this or if I could lose that or if I could have that, then I would belong. Plus, there was this thing called the permanent record. You all remember the permanent record? It's the evil twin of the book of life. The permanent record is kept in the principal's office. And it's where all the infractions, where all the faults, where all the transgressions are kept. You remember that afternoon, eighth grade, sun shining. Your parents say, now, the next time this happens, it's going on the permanent record. You remember this, right? Now, to be fair... Just to confuse you, they also said, now, all your accomplishments and achievements, that's going on there too. That's what they said. And you ask, so how many accomplishments and achievements do I need? And they always said a few more wouldn't hurt. And then they said to get those accomplishments, to get those achievements, you have to do battle with each other. And guess who you're doing battle with? Remember that kid in the sixth grade? He's now the competition. They only give out so many Rotary scholarships. All conference, all district, all state, that doesn't mean everybody, right? Most of us are not going to make it. So in contrast, when I say to you, this is a glorious morning, this is a glorious morning. This is a competition-free zone. God's economy makes no sense in the world. When Jesus calls us to follow, to believe, to receive the grace of God, he does not ask you to leave any part 
or any piece of you behind. Because on the cross, Jesus was all in. His body, his whole precious body was broken to show to us that God has done the saving work and wants to invite you and me to accept that true and abundant life that grows from a very, very, very real place called resurrection. And when grace is extended to us, it does not come in limited supply. It actually grows the more we receive it, the more God gives it to us, and we in turn offer it to each other. Jesus does welcome all of us. Now, let me be fair and let me be honest. When he welcomes us, he also changes us. Because he takes our vision and he perfects our vision. And over time, I'm able to see the world the way God sees the world. And while God welcomes all of us, he also invites all of us to grow up and to become what God truly intends us to be, which means over time the things that I thought mattered, they fall away, those childish things that I don't need anymore, and I'm given new things, new gifts for this time, and we fall. Lord Almighty, do we fall. And we keep falling. And we get back up. And we fail. Lord Almighty, do we fail. But God just reminds us we are already forgiven. But if I could say anything to anybody being confirmed, received, reaffirmed, or baptized today, but especially to these young people, especially to the sweet babies, what I want to say to you is this. The real invitation, the real invitation is to be here now. I remember already so much of our lives, we think about the past, about those regrets, about those things we didn't do, I wish I could do over. So already, probably as a young person, so much of the past paralyzes you. Or you're holding your breath. I think I held my breath for four years when I was a teenager. I'm going to hold my breath and I'm going to exhale when I finally reach some golden moment where I believe I am worthy to be loved either from humans or from the divine. But the invitation is now. Now is the time. Now is the day of salvation. Now is when you're being called. And you matter now. God loves you now. God desires all of you now. Every part of you that was washed in baptism God is going to work through all of you to continue to dwell in you and to delight in you and to equip you and to protect you and to enliven you. We need help. And God is the help. We need healing. Lord Almighty, do we need healing. And God's grace is the healing. Here's the hard one. We all need to feel as if we belong. You all belong in God's house. And God's house is a big, big, big house. Amen.